Welcome everyone, for, and thank you to our guest speaker, Dr. Bridget Smith, who is coming in uh, all the way from uh, Salt Lake State City, Utah. Uh, she is an assistant professor in the Division of Bachelor's Surgery in the Department of Surgery at, at the University of Utah. She is the vice chair for education in the Department of Surgery, and she also serves as program director for the Vascular Surgery Fellowship. Her academic focus in the surgical education research is with within the area of educational program outcomes, organization and optimization of clinical learning environment and quality of methods. Uh, she has recently in, been inducted to the American College of Surgeons Academy of Master Surgeon Educators, which is quite a big deal from what I understand. So uh, I did some Googling just to understand what that, how big a deal that was, but it's cool. So uh, thank you so much for Dr. Smith for coming all this way. Um, and uh, I'll let you take it away from here. All right, thank you for the introduction, um, Dr. Chan, and for inviting me to speak. This is a real honor and uh, I'm excited to be here. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. There we go. All right, um, so the topic um, at hand for the evening is one that I'm really excited um, to discuss it's important, I think, for all of us, both as clinicians in care of patients to establish psychological safety on our teams, um, and also as medical educators. Um, psychological safety is a concept that's been well established in literature on organizations and workplace learning and improvement, including in the healthcare industry, and actually particularly within complex environments like the operating room where I spend um, a great deal of my time. Um, and then there's also an emerging body of literature around the concept of psychological safety in medical education and in the learning environment as well. So this evening, I'm excited to discuss the concept of psychological safety as it pertains specifically to learning and why establishing psychological safety is so important for optimizing clinical learning outcomes for students, residents, fellows, um, and you know whatever other level of learner that you have in your space. So I hope to convince you that intentionally establishing psychologically safe learning environments is critical to the future of medical education. So the objectives over the next little while are these to define psychological safety and discuss how the concept relates to medical education and the learning environment, describe the risks that are inherent to learning and how impression management influences learning, and then to discuss some strategies for creating psychological safety in the clinical learning environment. And so I'll start here um, with Amy Edmondson, who's an American scholar of leadership teaming and organizational learning. She's currently the Novartis Professor of Leadership and Management at Harvard Business School and holds a PhD in organizational behavior. She's perhaps the most well-known social researcher in this domain and has investigated and described psychological safety as it pertains to organizations and work teams. In her early research, she focused on organizations actually in the business sector and was interested in exploring the concept of team learning and what factors support or inhibit work teams to learn from their history and errors in order to improve performance. And in one of her early studies that's represented here, she investigated team learning across a company that manufactures office furniture. And in that paper, she defines psychological safety as a shared belief held by members of a team that the team is safe for interpersonal risk taking. So as a group of clinicians, risk taking in our work environment is perhaps obvious and probably also strikes this audience as being of a of far greater consequence and importance than the risks that are taken on a team that's charged with manufacturing office furniture. But let's just consider the risk that a junior level employee might take by sharing their new ideas or their observations about prior mistakes amongst their work team. They might put their social status on the work team and their credibility with their colleagues in jeopardy if their idea is judged to be poor. And in addition, speaking up with observations about past mistakes on the part of the organization might affect a, like a senior manager's view of the junior employee. And they might then face repercussions for their career through negative performance evaluations and inability to be promoted and rise within the organization. So when psychological safety is present, team members have a sense of confidence that the team's not going to embarrass, reject, or in any way punish someone for speaking up. So they're willing to take those risks and that's to the benefit of the company. 
And one company that has that really figured out is Google. So the presence of psychological safety has been shown to improve team performance and team and organizational learning. So work teams perform better when psychological safety is present. New ideas are shared leading to increased pace of innovation and mistakes can be rapidly identified and corrected. So the organization learns and improves. At Google, psychological safety is viewed as one of the most important aspects of their team's dynamics and teams that demonstrate higher levels of psychological safety have been shown to achieve higher sales numbers. So creating a psychologically safe learning environment is really embedded within Google's culture and teams actually begin their meetings with check-ins where they discuss risks that were taken in the previous week. For healthcare teams um, in clinical learning environments, or in clinical environments, the implications for having or not having psychological safety are perhaps obvious. The shared goal here of the team is the care of the patient and psychologically safe environments enable any or all members of this team to speak up should a patient safety risk or a concern arise. So for example, imagine a situation in which one of the overhead lights in this picture in the operating room theater does not have a sterile handle attached to it. And let's just say that the attending surgeon and the resident and the scrub tech don't recognize that situation, but the medical student does. In an environment that's lacking in psychological safety, the student is unlikely to speak up about this risk to the sterility of the procedure and, and ultimately patient safety. And in fact, this is a true story that was shared in this recent perspectives piece in Annals of Surgery. So unfortunately, while psychological safety is incredibly important on healthcare teams, Clinical work environments have several unique features that pose challenges to establishing psychological safety. So first of all, the clinical environment um, and the one pictured here in the operating room is high stakes. Team functioning in this often fast paced and uncertain environment is critical to care for the patient. Human life is quite literally at risk and when processes fail, um, human life is at risk. So creating, um, that creates risk aversion, that members of the team are not really willing to engage in real-time problem solving. And it's difficult to empower and encourage everybody to feel safe sharing their ideas when the risk of being wrong is, is really quite high. Second, this environment is interprofessional. In this picture, we can see um, people that maybe there's an anesthesiologist, a scrub tech, a nurse circulator, um, the surgeon, maybe a resident or a student, so at times the diverse training and backgrounds of all these different members of the team can result in lack of a shared mental model. It can be difficult to integrate knowledge and expertise across these different levels and types of experience in part because the individuals might not even recognize um, things that they take for granted that they know that others might not. So information often goes unshared. In addition to the interprofessional nature of the team, medicine is pervaded by entrenched hierarchies. And this is a problem because research as early as the late 70s has demonstrated that patient outcomes are significantly inversely correlated with the degree of hierarchy in a healthcare team interaction. And counterproductive hierarchical communication patterns um, that derive from status differences are partly responsible for many medical errors. Large power differentials are also perceived and often they're actually present on healthcare teams. And these power differentials are a significant barrier to establishing psychological safety as they impose increased risk to those on the team who have less power. So um, now the reason we're all here this evening is to talk about psychological safety in the context of medical learners. And so let's add learners into this environment. These factors that affect the clinical team dynamic simply in the context of getting the work done or taking care of the patient. Now, when we add students, residents, or fellows onto this team, there's another layer that complicates establishment of psychological safety. And that's what you see here that was already added that medical education learners are under constant scrutiny and evaluation. So let's turn to this scene, um, a scenario where the team is rounding on the inpatient wards. And in this picture, we see physical evidence of hierarchies and power differentials in the clinical learning environment. Traditionally, medical students wear short white coats while other members of the team wear long white coats. Um, that's not true everywhere, um, but it's pretty common. And in addition, one of the students is standing kind of to the back of the group, respecting the hierarchy and ensuring that her senior residents are central, so not overstepping rank. 
Now the students in the picture are seeking to learn in this social setting with very distinct social and cultural norms. And we know that learning is social in nature as outlined by social cognitive theory um, that we learn from and in interaction with others and within our environment. So medical education is situated or characterized by the grounding of learning in real experiences of daily living that create opportunities for learners to live and learn in the context where those experiences occur. And we've all probably heard of Laven Winger who emphasized the role of social interaction and participation as key components of the learning process. So communities of practice provide the context in which learners share knowledge, they reflect, engage in dialogue and practice. And learners join healthcare teams out on the periphery. The beliefs and culture of the team shape their learning process for those newcomers. And that the beliefs and culture, of course, include this presence or lack of psychological safety. Hopefully learners are able to move from the peripheral role in terms of their participation towards a more central role um, from beginner uh, moving towards expert. So for example, we'll consider this scene again, the medical student on the wards that's seeing a patient with a congestive heart failure exacerbation. Ideally, the student should engage in discussion about the patient and ask questions to increase their understanding about heart failure. Senior members of the team might answer their questions or pose new ones to the learner who then reads about the disease and practices their physical exam skills. The next and rounds, the student might bring to the group new evidence from the literature or draw the attention of the team to possible changes in the patient's clinical status or physical exam or report on labs or imaging. And they assume a more credible role within the group. So that credibility enables the student increasing participation within the group and access to additional learning opportunities. So taking those risks to present the patient and their findings can have rewards um, for their education. So consider this in the context of the healthcare team that we just described. The students near the bottom of the medical hierarchy, they have very little, if any, power within the team. And there really is a large differential from their lack of power to the power that's held by the attending. And the stakes are high for both the patient who's being cared for by this team and now also for the learner. So let's talk next then about what's at stake or what is risky for a medical learner, including students, residents, and fellows. Because the core of our definition of psychological safety is that team members need to feel safe to take risks. So first, and not to be minimized, is the risk of embarrassment or humiliation that accompanies being wrong. Being made to feel incompetent has implications for learners' self-efficacy or their judgments about their performance capabilities in a domain of activity that may contain novel, unpredictable, or stressful features. Self-efficacy is enhanced through attainment of performance goals. And so when learners feel that they have underperformed or failed at a question or task, their self-efficacy could be decreased. And with it, their likelihood of believing that they're capable of achieving in that domain during future encounters. This is Sir William Osler. Um, Dr. Osler employed pimping in teaching his apprentices at Johns Hopkins circa 1900. Um, Abraham Flexner, in his efforts to examine medical education um, for what was later dubbed the Flexner Report, visited Johns Hopkins to observe Osler's educational programs and processes. And in unpublished notes, he wrote, rounded with Osler today, riddles house officers with questions like a Gatling gun. Welch says students call it pimping, delightful. Pimping, as we all know and love it today, typically involves brief factual questions that usually pertain to history and often eponyms or lists. So for example, for me in vascular surgery, if I'm doing a fistula operation, I'll ask my student or junior resident, what is the rule of sixes pertaining to fistula maturation, which is a very classic list. Um, this type of brief focused questioning works really well in surgical specialties due to the fast paced, high intensity nature of our work, but we should consider our goals when we pimp. Um, and perhaps one goal is genuinely to teach. Certainly the review of facts is part of learning. And the more that we actively recall information, the better we retain. But another goal of pimping is evaluative. So that's the constant evaluation piece of the environment. If our learners know their stuff and they're able to navigate our pimping sessions, we evaluate their medical knowledge positively relative to other learners who might not perform so well. But there's one additional goal of pimping that's important to think about. 
In a 1989 commentary in the Journal of the American Medical Association, Brancati notes that while at the surface pimping appears to be Socratic instruction, the deeper motivation is political. Proper pimping, he says, inculcates the intern with a profound and abiding respect for his attending physician while ridding the intern of needless self-esteem. Furthermore, after being pimped, he is drained of the desire to ask new questions, questions that his attending may be unable to answer. If you read the article, you'll see that it's written with a lighthearted sense of jest. However, the descriptions certainly resonate, at least with me. And what the author is really pointing at is the goal of pimping to establish hierarchy. Questioning typically begins with the most junior learners and progresses stepwise up the ladder. And when I was an intern on a surgical oncology service, we had a weekly teaching session with faculty. And each week my chief would offer to buy the whole team breakfast if we could successfully keep the questions from making their way up the chain to him. So while establishment of hierarchy is not necessarily a bad thing in and of itself, that process can create a stressful learning environment and it may be perceived as embarrassing or humiliating. Thank <music> you.